all is well here at the farm. We had an amazing celebration, marriage celebration yesterday. Um, we're getting little bits of pictures here and there coming in. They're pretty cool. I'll be posting some of those. And God, it's just so good. I mean, it, it was just a, a, more than I could have ever dreamed of. Very simple in the barn, just family. Uh, you know, I, of course, had my kids, my grandkids, and um, some friend, a few friends there from um, from the well, people I've known forever. And then uh, Doug's family came in, his two brothers, and then his daughter was able to bring three of the grandkids with her. And uh, yesterday, before before the, um, you know, celebration started, they're out in the yard playing baseball. It's my kind of day, right? It was really <laughs> my kind of day. It really was. But, you know, um, my kids um, all stepped up and did all of it, the decorating, the food. Uh, they did the whole nine yards and it's just so uh, such a beautiful picture of how blessed I am with this family. It was just uh, just an act of love they did. And it was just perfect. It was perfect. But, you know, we had uh, the, uh, Ava Grace. I might be uh, posting one of the videos, but Ava Grace is my little seven year old granddaughter. And I was trying to explain to her, well, we already got married and now we're just going to like have a party. And she goes, that's not fair. And I said, what's not fair? And she said, we don't get to see a kiss on the lips. <laughs> it was so adorable. So cute. So when the time came, I said, okay, but she was sitting up front, just waiting, right? I said, you ready to see that kiss on the lips? And she came up to us to stand right in front of us to see the kiss on the lips. So Ava Grace was so sweet, but it was a wonderful day. And I just thank you all for prayers and support. And uh, all I can say is God is always full of surprises because I certainly wasn't looking for this. I wasn't, uh, I was very content in my life. And the Lord said, oh, but you need a suitable partner. And so here I am. <laughs> That's how it goes. But thank you guys. I wish, I wish everybody could have come to it. I got, uh, for those of you on the, on the line that know Steve Croft, oh my gosh, what an amazing prayer he sent. Uh, just an amazing prayer for us. It was just so wonderful. To, it's wonderful to be loved like that. It really is. And um, I'm just so grateful. So. How's everybody else? Do we have any uh, specific? How about Amanda? We uh, Amanda, right from last week, Denise? Uh, yeah, so we're still praying and believing for a miracle. Okay. And okay. my nephew, he's 44, and he's lived a wayward life, never prison or anything like that, but he's always been like in the drinking parties and the marijuana parties and in the hot, hard rock band playing oh. that. He played a guitar in that, some sort of instrument. And he made his profession of faith today. He'd already received Jesus, but he went forward in church today and he's going to be baptized in the next. Oh, Christmas. wow. You just made my day. That's beautiful. He was the one, the family that you would, not that you can judge or know what God's going to do in somebody's heart, but, you know, the least likely to be the one that would do that. But he, you know, the first will be last and the last will be first. Well, I'll tell you what, it kind of goes along with our message tonight. That's, that's so beautiful. Yeah, I would have been the last one anybody would would think about, really. You know, I was a very happy heathen. I did it well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I used to say I sinned in total peace. You know, I didn't know what it, I was. I was, I was really content in my, in my uh, brokenness, right? But I would definitely be the one. I was very judgmental. I, I say like Paul, but no, think nobody's like Paul. But uh, yeah, Jesus freaks. Jesus freaks. Mocked everybody like you. And look what he can do with the life. So I'm, I'm excited. He's got a great testimony, that guy. He sure does. I thank yeah. God. Yeah, that's going to be exciting to see, you know, as he grows. It's going to be very exciting. Well, he had he was real mouthy. And he had gone to this service station. And somebody had cut him off at the gas pumps. And he got out and just didn't to tell him what he said to him. Well, while he was pumping his gas, they came up behind him and hit him in the back of the head. Oh, the doctor said it should have killed him because the brain, the bleed, he got hit in the back of the head, but the blood, it, the blood came from the front of the brain, his mm -hmm. brain bleed. And the doctor told my sister he should be dead. But he's wow. a little slow now. You know, he takes it. He he has to concentrate to stay on track. But he's not. I mean, it didn't really. It didn't cause him to be uh, dysfunctional or anything because he still lives by himself. He, you know, he just has short term memory loss because of it. But mm -hmm. you know, God can take anything and turn it around yes. for all good. Uh, so, and he's, he's gonna get your attention one way or another, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you got mine, that's for sure. Thank God nothing tragic like that, but you got mine. Any prayer requests then as we go on tonight? 
Well, you I might think, be able to uh, some health issues if you'd pray. His name is Mike Smith. Mike Smith, okay. Okay. And, and Steve and Donna Croft, who were, I mean, because they still yes. have issues, you know. And, um, and then uh, there's a guy at my church, and I can't think of his name right at the moment. He left me about two minutes ago. Mm -hmm. But his, he's been taking care of his wife. She's 84. She can't move her arms. So he gets up and takes care of her lovingly every morning. Wow. Takes care of her lunches. That's beautiful. Care of her before bed, all that kind of stuff. That's his primary function during the day. And if he has to go out, he makes sure that someone's there with her. Wow. And, um, and then, he, but he cares for her rather than taking her someplace and putting her in charge of somebody else. So. Well, you know what, oh, we were just talking about that recently. It didn't, you know, in fact, I was talking about selling real estate and just kind of some kind of hokey stories. But I said, you know, it's funny how we would sell historic properties and people would walk in and say, um, has anybody ever died here? And I'm like, the question is, if it's like how many died here? Because we didn't used to put people away in, in, in places like that. You know, we had generational right. living and, um, you know, praise God that he has the strength and stamina to take care of his bride, right? Yeah, that's a good thing. And so I'm, and, and I'm doing a lot better. So I, I'm, I'm grateful for each and every day. Yeah, I, I have to say you have a glow. Oh, get out of you! Oh, Michael, come on. People like when you get pregnant, people say that nonsense. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no glow going on, my. <laughs> it's the imaginary glow going on, right? Hey, yep. there, there's Erica. She can attest to the fact that I'm not glowing any more than I usually glow, right? <laughs> oh, you were glowing yesterday like crazy. <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> you guys are funny. Thank you so much. Well, let's get on with it, as I say. Um, have anybody willing to open us up in prayer? Um, I, I would be delighted to do that. I would love to. Thank so, you, Michael. Uh, Lord, we just, we just want to thank you for this time to be with you be with your son Jesus. We want to thank you for uh, giving Lynn the message for us today. We want to thank you for all the blessings that you showered upon her to show her that she does indeed need uh, to have a partner that helps her in, in her challenges with uh, the things that she does. And if we need steel-toed shoes and uh, ankle shin guards, then she tells us in advance so that we can be prepared uh, for the message of the day. And we're, we're grateful for every opportunity and for myself, I know I'm grateful just every day that I open my eyes and I can see the beauty that's around me that you provide us each and every day as a gift. And it's just something that's on loan to us while we're here mm -hmm. doing your will the way that you want it done. Just help us and guide us with that message and lead us down the right path. So we are always continuing to help our fellow man by, by loving them as much as we love ourselves, as your commandment says. So thank you, Jesus Christ, in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Michael. I appreciate that. And uh, as you guys, I guess some of you saw, and some people thought maybe this is a romantic thing, but it's not a romantic thing. This is what the Lord put on my heart as I was thinking about love. Um, and it's the weight of love. You know, there's all kinds of love, right? It's kind of it's kind of crazy that we have in the... In the uh, American, you know, language, we have one word for love, you know, I remember my, my, both of my sons-in-law, when they came to me, they had enough respect, I'm just so grateful to come to me as a single mom and ask, you know, for permission to marry my daughter, and I'd say, well, why do you want to marry my daughter, and, and they said, well, I love her, and I said, well, I love steak, that's not good enough, <laughs> <laughs> we would take it from there, but we just have one word, right, and so, uh, but, you know, it's easy to imagine the kind of love between a man and a woman. You could see that certainly uh, yesterday in our celebration. We see it in our life. You hopefully have it in your life and where you've experienced it in your life. You know, so with that, that, that's kind of easy to wrap your head around. But, you know, to be honest with you, uh, you know, the Bible mentions love, and at least in the New King James Version, 361 times. And there are very few of those verses that are pertaining to the love between a man and a woman. This is talking about Christ-like love. And, uh, you know, that is an entirely different picture, if you will. First Corinthians 13, of course, says, and now these three things remain, faith, 
hope and love, but the greatest of these is love. So love is greater than faith and hope and that they both depend on love for their mere existence. So you can think about it, you can't have faith, you can't have hope, you know, without the love. So without love, there can be no true faith. A, a, a loveless faith is nothing, you know, but an empty kind of religious exercise. You know, there's religious people that we talk about. And as Paul says, if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I have nothing. And so, you know, when we look out at this world today, honestly speaking, you see a whole uh, a lack of that love that we should be expressing in a dark world. And, and instead, we're, you know, hiding under a bed. We're praying like crazy people. We're, you know, making all kinds of comments and expecting all kinds of things. But that, that Christ-like love, you know, where is it? it should be coming out of our pores. In fact, it's, it's, we, we're joking. You know, Michael says, I have a glow. Erica said, yes, she was glowing. You know what? You should see the glow of Jesus Christ on me, the love for him every single day everywhere I go. That's the goal, right? So uh, faith and hope are, are, are dead, worthless things if they aren't accompanied by love. And unfortunately, I think that's one one um, example, if you will, how some people have de deceived themselves about their faith at all, right? They think, well, I, I'm good. You know, I got, I got this going on. I got that going on. I go to church. I tick, check it off the thing, you know, and I, 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 I don't, but they have no love. You don't see the love there. You know, uh, when we talk about the compassion of Christ, you know, that was a you know, just a physical, you know, your bowels are all turned, can't rest because of something. You know, that's what uh, compassion drives the love and love drives the action, right? And so if we lack love, boy, we're in big trouble. You know, one of the reasons that love is the greatest gift um, is that it's really uh, the whole uh, definition of the nature of God. You know, First John 4, 8 says, God is love. That's what he is. So imagine you got all these people walking around, supposed to be followers of Christ, but we don't have love. God is love. So uh, God gives us his love and, and we're supposed to reflect that back to him and, and as ambassadors, you know, for, be a reflection of him. And, and it says we love because he first loved us. You know, I think if I talk about this often, we keep our eyes on that cross. We never forget how much he loves us and what he's done for us. It makes that journey just uh, unfold and jesus said as the father has loved me so i have loved you now remain in my love if you keep my commands you will remain in my love that's a way of gosh that's a little scary right we see so many people lacking love uh you know if you keep my commands you will remain in love just as i have kept my father's commands and remain in his love i have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. So he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command, love each other. You know, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? I mean, out of, I didn't really look, but out of the 361 times the King James, New King James uh, version mentions, I wonder how many times is that reminder? I love you, you better love me, right? Or love people, love each other, love, 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 love. We're told that, and, and yet uh, in the flesh, that is so hard to do. And I think that's the point, you know, for relying on how we feel, what we do, you know, I, again, I, you know, I just uh, went into this union in my life and I know that the, I, my number one purpose here in this marriage is to glorify God. That's his purpose, my purpose to walk the journey. It's not a day, do I feel good? You know, that has nothing to do with it. Although I'm sure we'll have plenty of times where I'm whining because I don't feel good. But that's not what it's about. It's about glorifying God and everything in our life should be that way. So love is something that always has existed, you know, upon the, the persons of the Trinity. That's the encompassing thing. God is love and it doesn't have any beginning and it doesn't have any end and it doesn't have any conditions. And so we have a tendency though, don't we, to have a beginning and end on love. You can, you can, you can cross me one more time and I don't love you anymore. We have a beginning and an end and, uh, you know, and things that, uh, you know, actually die out, but love doesn't work that way. Jesus taught that the greatest two commandments are you both include love. Isn't that interesting? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. Look at that. Love, 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 right? And then love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on to these two commandments. So here we are, you know, the two greatest commandments, they both include love. And yet, again, we are so hard pressed to, to, to express that love, to feel that genuine love 
the kind of love that we need to feel. But you know what? If we don't love other people, even those unlovable ones, and we're going to talk about that, right? It's not possible to genuinely love God, period. That's the bottom line. So if you struggle with that, you really need to be searching your heart. You know, it's, it, it, it's not possible. You can't love God that way. Remember, he said, if you follow my commands, you can't love him that way and, and find it easy to not love other people. It's not possible. They can't, they can't coexist, right? And so we need to really examine our hearts if we struggle with that kind of thing. Um, we need to think about that and pray about that and get our heart right so that we can express that love. Nowhere does it say you got to love just the nice ones, the ones like you. You know, that's not what it's about. It's about love everybody the way he loved us. And that, again, if we don't draw close to him, if we don't tap into him, it's not possible to do this. It's, it's just not. But if we do, you know, it's almost effortless. You know, uh, I, it's interesting. I, you know, I wrote that book, Walking on Water. It's really like a mini testimonial, you know, of my life. And, and I've had so many people, it, it shares in there that I was, you know, molested by a family member. And it went on for about nine months. It was very, it was a tragic situation. But the bottom line is I forget, right? And so I've had so many people reach out and say, well, I'm not forgiving the one that hurt me. Well, I don't know what to tell you. If you can't love, you can't forgive, you can't walk with Jesus. It's, a, it's, it's, it's just got to happen. But when you seek him, again, you, you look at, you know, Lord, I want to be like you. And, and you seek that forgiveness and you look for that love. You can extend it to anybody. It's not anybody that you should be withholding from. First John 4, 19 says, we love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. Now, look, don't look at that word and say, well, they drive me crazy and I don't like them, but I don't hate them. You know, trust me, either, it's, it's either love or hate. There's nothing in between, right? You're either for God or you're against God. There's nothing in between. And so, you know, if you hate your brother, if you harbor something against him, if you refuse to forgive him, that person is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and, or and sister. We're talking about everybody okay not just your cherry pick group and not just your bloodline but everybody matthew 5 21 you have heard that it was said to the people long ago you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment but i tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment think about that how many times today have you struggled with somebody being angry with somebody right again anyone who says to a brother or sister raka is impossible, uh, excuse me, un, is answerable to the court. And anyone says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Boy, oh boy, that's scary. Uh, raka comes from a, a Aramaic term, uh, raka. And it's, a, it's actually a derogatory thing. It's an insulting thing. And it means, you know, empty headed uh, or, or you know, brainless, mindless, uh, insinuated persons is stupid or they're inferior in some way. It was an offensive name to be used to show contempt for someone else. And you know what? We do the same thing today. You idiot, you moron, whatever it is, right? And so here we are. We're not even supposed to think those things, right? Much less feel those things. So there was great, uh, you know, consequence there for anyone who would say, you fool. Or, 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 or Raka, which is that insulting thing, you brainless one, you know, mindless one, you know, uh, how many times do we say some version of that in our world? That's not love, okay? So have you ever called even in your mind someone, an idiot, a jerk, somebody cuts you off in traffic, somebody treats you poorly in a store? So and is anything, have you ever done that? An idiot, a jerk, a moron, you know? Well, this is very serious business and because the biggest part of that is that there's no love in that, right? There's no, no looking at what, how does Christ see you? How, how did he see you when he was willing to die on the cross for every piece of junk in your life? How did he see you? And again, so if you remember the cross and you're going to say, oops, he forgave me. I got to forgive. He loved me. I got to love. It's pretty simple stuff when you look at it that way. But when we don't focus on that, if we, if we kind of get back into that, uh, what I called in that uh, message not too long ago, cheap grace, where you just rely on, I got my ticket punched, I'm good. Oh, there's a whole lot more to it than that. You don't just get your ticket punched. You see, if you really accept Christ as your savior, you begin to live for him, not just with him, but you're going to live for him. And it's a, a sanctification process as we mature, right? Weeding out some of these things. You know, some people struggle for a little bit with their anger or whatever. They're, but what but, but we work on it, we repent of it. We ask for help with it and, and we move on from it, right? We, we learn from it and become more of what he intends for us to be. First John 3, this is how we know that uh, what is love. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. 
we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, do not let us love with words or speech, but with actions and a truth. And so it can't just be, oh, everyone feels sorry for them, or worse than that, oh, they just better get a job, or they must be managing their money poorly. Well, I was just having this conversation with Doug before we got on the call about, you know, how it, it's okay. Uh, seven, uh, the average family spending 700 plus more dollars a month just to live, you know, than they were in January, for instance, you know, and that's some food and gas and people struggling, trying to make it work, stay at home moms trying to keep staying at home, right, and so we, we look at these needs out there, and we can't be judging them or go get a job, you know, we can't be doing that, we're going to be faced with lots and lots and lots of people struggling, and what an amazing opportunity it is to be a witness for the love of Jesus Christ, okay, and so I know some people are of the belief that, you know, uh, any help that a church gives, for instance, needs to be for inside the church. It, you don't gonna, you're never going to see that. We're supposed to take care of our own, no doubt about it. But we're all supposed to get out into that world and be a witness. And that's one way we can really, really help um, if we can extend that hand. But anyway, if, if, it, if any man uh, has material possessions, sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity, which is uh, translates to be also the word compassion, has no compassion, there's nothing within you. Even if you can't do a stinking thing about it, there should be something within you that just wells up over their pain, right? That's what love looks like. And so, um, you know, we've, we've got to love, just talk it out, but we've got to live it out. So now we get to the weight of the love, right? You're familiar with this story, I'm sure, but it's from Mark 2, and it's it's about, you know, Jesus has come to Capernaum. He's got the crowd going on, and, you know, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door of where he was, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. He saw the faith of these four men, right? Well, who, who were these four men? You know, the first and most important thing, you know, about this whole message is not the healing of the paralytic, but it's these four men that, that showed up, you know, digging into a roof and popping somebody down to meet Jesus. So it's a whole lot less about him and much more about those four men. So who were these men? You know, if I, if I opened up the line and said, who do you think? I mean, I think probably most people say, oh, they had to be family members. You know, and we automatically think they got to be somebody's man knows really well. I mean, they cared enough to cart him through the street and open up a roof and put in there. You don't know that. You, you know, why do you assume they're family members? Because of the love? You know, we might look at any needs that we can, uh, you know, tend to or, or, or care about or, 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 feel, or have that compassion for. You know, I hope it's not just family members, but when we see this kind of love, we automatically hear most people would say, well, they've got to be family members. Or, or why would you assume that they're just good friends? They, you know, we don't know any of that. They could be just four minute love to say, this man has, so we're going to Jesus, right? We don't know any of that, but that's the way our mind thinks. We like to help our own. Uh, you know, be be drawn to our own, you know, if something amazing happens, it probably came from somebody you have a bloodline with, right, but that's not true, compassion does not discriminate, so whoever these four men were, you, you know, and we don't know who they were, you know, I would like you, just for the remainder of the time, just imagine they're you and me, pick four people on the line, there's four of us, right, it's not family members, not close friends, just four people who love Jesus. Okay. That's what we need to look at. But the first thing I want to look at is these men were willing, you know what, who's willing <laughs> when it get, how many of us would actually do that? Right. Would, would say, well, we're going to cart this person. You know, they, they, they knew that what the streets were like, very uneven, rocky terrain, right. Uh, it, no doubt in the world, it's hot as blazes there. And so they knew their distance they'd have to travel. They knew how rough it would be. They, they, they knew the heat of the day. And yet the four men are carrying this paralytic to Jesus. Those men decided they would get off their behinds, which is what we need to be doing, right? And they would carry this man. They knew, they believed, right? Your sins are forgiven. They knew that if they could get him in the presence of Jesus, everything's going to be all right. You know, that's a 
See, it's really kind of a, like it was with this person, uh, the nephew that Denise was sharing, right? If he could just get in the presence of Jesus, he will be healed. That's true for everybody. And so here we are. We know that these men were willing. How many of us would be willing to do that? How many of us will get our hands dirty? How many of us will exert the energy? How many of us would get off our behinds and, and carry the load for someone, carry somebody, so to speak, uh, to Jesus, how many of us would do that? The next thing, you know, uh, when they eventually get to the house, they got this plan, apparently. I don't think they just grabbed him. But, you know, he, they carry him to the house. Uh, you know, what were they looking, they confronted with? Well, a massive crowd. So they look out there, there's crowd, there's, you know, massive people trying to get in there to see Jesus and, you know, the noise and the chaos and whatever. And it, on the surface, um, you know, it would look like the impossible thing, getting this man before Jesus. How many people would just say, well, you know, forget about it. It's a great idea. Can't get there from here, right? How many of us, you know, uh, would get tired? It's hot. But, you know, I, I really don't want, I would do that. But, you know, I'm no spring chicken. I don't think I can carry you that far. I would do that. But, man, I hate the heat. Well, how many of us would do this, right? The sacrificial thing, you know, would would, would, would do to, to, to get the door open, get the stretcher in the door, uh, you know, and then try and fail. How many of us would just give it up? Well, we, it was really good thought. We'll just stop and pray. Well, I wish I could help them, but it's too far. Well, let's just stop and pray. Uh, -uh It doesn't work that way. So they knew they, what they were up against and they were still unstoppable because they knew he needed to see Jesus. And that's the way we should look at all the lost ones, isn't it? We should look at them and say, I will do whatever is humanly possible to get this lost person in the presence of Jesus, because this lost person isn't going to a holding tank when they die. They're going to hell when they die. And so it, we should be so filled with compassion that we want to do whatever we can to get that unsaved person in the presence of Jesus. And that's what these four men did. Most of us would have given up. You know, my, I'm, I'm so, this has become my slogan. I should patent it, right? But I'm also saying, get on with it, right? They, they didn't give up. You know, I'll also say, don't tell me no, tell me how, right? And so they thought of this preposterous solution. I mean, think about it for a second. You know, be, listen, people had houses back then. I'm sure they cared about their houses just as much back then as they do today. They decide they're going to cart this guy up. Can you even imagine how hard that was? Even on a, just a one-story house roof, it doesn't matter. They're carting this guy up. Uh, they decide to completely destroy the integrity of the roof of this home, right? They went on with it. <laughs> they, they put they put the uh, put a man-sized hole stretcher. Remember, he's on a stretcher big enough that they could lower him. But can you imagine? What, what happened in that place as dust and rocks and stuff's falling down there and just out of out of nowhere, some guy with a stretcher. Can you imagine that as they plotted that, you know, right there in the street, you know, they get there, they got good intentions. Remember, you don't know that they're family members and you don't know that they're friends. So we cart this guy there and we say, we can't even get in the place. You know, we can't get him in, and, but he's got to see Jesus. See, we should be so driven to, to introduce the lost people to Jesus that we're like that, right? Because Jesus is the only hope any of us have. So, you know, we can't give up. The, imagine they say, we, we can't give up. We got to somehow figure this thing out. That's what faith, hope, and love looks like. So they had faith that if they got him in the presence of Jesus, they had hope that they would be able to get him in the presence of Jesus, right? And, 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 and they went on with love, right? So this is the same commitment all of us need to have. The same commitment that drives us on, that keeps us going, that makes us get on with it, right? Even when the co uh, evidence of our eyes tells us it looks hopeless. Uh, Denise just said that, uh, you know, she's talking about her nephew getting saved. And of all the people, he, he, he looked like he was hopeless, right? He was that black sheep out there. He was the wayward one. He was the one, you know, with all kinds of mess in his life. He would be the one least likely, like I was in my family, right? So your eyes might say, oh, no, that, that, that's hopeless. Can't do anything with that. We have to believe that if we get on with it, if we can just get them in the presence of Jesus, everything will be okay. And you know what? We find a way and we're willing to pay the price. I mean, what was that like back then? I'm sure they didn't lawyer up and sue them, but you know, it wasn't peaceful. I'm sure when they were ripping through the roof and tearing the house up, they were willing to do whatever and to pay the price for it. The consequences to get this man, this man who needed Jesus in his presence. Why is it any different for us, right? And, and what will we do? These men struggled through the streets. And again, when they arrived where he was, they were challenged by that large crowd, but they became innovators, right? They took him in that roof, pulled the roof apart with their bare hands. You know, they had toiled and sweated in the sun. They carted this person there. They're there and by golly, it's going to happen, right? And so they their, their one final push and they and they and they lowered this man down so that he could they could get this man at the feet of Jesus. 
everything is good if we could just get in the face of Jesus, right? So they weren't concerned about the consequences, apparently. I mean, they didn't stop and say, I don't know how much trouble we think we'll get, how much you think it costs to repair the roof. That's what we do. We thinking we're trying to intellectualize something that can't be intellectualized when we love the way we're, we're supposed to love. That's what it looks like. So what con consequences would you be, be willing to accept to carry someone to Jesus? Will you, will you uh, be willing to be hated? Uh, Jesus said that they'll hate you because of me, but you're not bringing them up. They're not going to hate you. Okay. But if you bring them up and you push and you, and you do whatever, you get innovative, you get creative, you get bold, you know, you're going to be hated. And so you want to do that for Christ? You know, are you willing to be fired from your job? You know, if you have an opportunity to carry somebody into the face of or to feet of Jesus, are you willing to take that price for it? Do you take that risk for it? Maybe you're not. What about my bills? Well, what about your faith? And, you know, are you willing to be persecuted? And that time's coming, my friends, and more and more, and more. It's it's coming. And, you know, we definitely see it in the in the church, uh, you know, as in a, a local, the body church, you know, uh, we're seeing uh, all kinds of persecution, you know, people getting into pastors getting in trouble th for this and pastors get in trouble for that. And, you know, Homeland Security investigating donations given to other. It, it's it's Matt, it's beginning. So you better <laughs> you better Jesus up or you won't be strong enough to even endure. But if you want to sit back quietly and just go to your prayer closet and think that's all you're ever expected to do, you'll be surprised, first of all. But you don't have to worry about being persecuted. Nobody's going to persecute you. You're no threat. The enemy doesn't need to worry about you. You're not a threat, right? And are you willing to uh, pay the price at all, any price? You know, what are you willing to do knowing that, uh, you know, we talked about hell recently, right? Maybe last week, can't remember. But, you know, what are you willing to do to save that? Are you willing to just, just, the, just the ones that are pretty, the ones you like? Is that the ones you're willing to fight for? You know, for all those that need salvation, we should be prepared to do whatever it takes to introduce them, whatever. You laugh at me, you hate me, you, you, you don't invite me to Thanksgiving. It doesn't matter. We should be willing to do whatever, just like those four men. Get it out of your head again that they were brought. Listen, I, most families are just, I, probably all families are dysfunctional. And, and probably if any one of us said to four family members, will you cart me? Let's just make it up. Will you cart me a mile down the road and, and take me to Jesus? And if we can't get in there, will you bust somebody's roof over and lower? You got to be kidding me. You know, we wouldn't do it, right? So what would we be willing to do? Well, we, we definitely need to be on our knees, no doubt about that. I don't mean to ever sound like prayer is not important. But, uh, you know, nowhere will you read that it's only prayer that we're supposed to do. So even when the evidence of your eyes tells you that that person, you know, probably will never come to Jesus like Denise's, you know, nephew, like me, you know, we got to get on our knees a little bit more. We don't give up. We don't say, well, they're helpless. They're worthless. They did. They did. They've heard the gospel. We don't do that. We just keep going, keep on camp, cut a hole in the roof and get them before Jesus. So we have to be prepared to break down those barriers, whatever it takes. And are you, you know, so smash through the roof, uh, you know, get that person in front of Jesus, whatever it takes. So the story is not at all, again, about the paralytic. It's about the four men. That could be you and it could be me. It could be any four of us. It could be any one of us, right? That's what it's about. What are you willing to do? How much do you love to be willing to do whatever it takes to get somebody at the feet of Jesus where all the hope is found you know what comes to your mind when you see this guy uh, probably mm, instant something came up in you right uh, disgusting maybe or dangerous or criminal or evil or maybe he's a gang member or a satanist or whatever you call people that you see and I've heard it so I know we all do it right whatever you think or maybe you don't get as bold as to speak it but what you think well you know what you'd be right on all accounts there uh, it is disgusting he was dangerous and criminal and evil and gang member satanist all those things are true and and but there, but there's no love in that is there when we look at a life like this you really look at it with judgment don't you say oh it's so sad I want to see where his I see where his body is I want to see where soul is you know do we look past that my goodness how many people did christ looks but look past a lot you know by the way you know people uh you know with the uh, leprosy they weren't pretty to look at okay their flesh is rotten off that wasn't pretty jesus went to them how about the demonics that are naked and screaming and uncontrollable jesus went to them how about the the, the prostitutes in the street all dolled up and you know ready to sleep with men for money jesus went to them so there's no love in looking at somebody like this and drawing our own conclusions it's human nature 
but there's no love in it, right? Someone loved him enough, though, to carry him. Somebody loved him enough to stick him on that stretcher and cart him down the street and do whatever they had to do. They, they broke that roof open. They were willing to do whatever. In the, in the face of what somebody, you would say he's dangerous, uh, you know, he's a criminal, a Satanist or whatever. In fact, you can see on his face, you know, little uh, tattoos of tears, which is indicate an indication that he has, you know, taken two lives. So here we are. Somebody did whatever they had to do to get him. They were willing to take the risk to introduce him to Jesus. The question is, would you? Would you look at this poor soul and just have all that human reaction of judgment? and lack of love and hatred maybe, right? When you take a look at what he's done to himself. When you see that, by the way, guys, it's not a fashion statement. These are hurting people. And so there's some reason they want to do this to themselves. But this person introduced uh, this young man to Jesus. Well, I want you to meet Adam. He's an atheist. He was an atheist, demon oppressed, addicted to drugs, suicidal and depressed, a descendant grandson of the great preacher and theologian, Charles Spurgeon. Can you even imagine the prayers? You know, I know for me, like when I pray, it's not just for my children and for my children's children, it's for all generations because I know that the legacy of my faith is the biggest thing it carries on, right? And so imagine the prayers that went up before he was ever even thought of uh, from this family, from the, uh, you know, Charles Spurgeon and families. So he's a great descendant that somewhere great grand 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 right you know while he was on a verge of suicide this lady loved him enough to tell him about jesus the great grandson or whatever uh, charles spurgeon this woman don't you think maybe a little scary knowing how dangerous he's an atheist he's demon oppressed he's got all this going on but she told him about jesus and he called out to jesus and was gloriously saved immediately delivered of his addiction and uh, all, all this oppression, right? He said that every molecule in his body was filled with love he had never experienced before. He had a true come to Jesus meeting, right? He, he was baptized by a pastor by the name of Phil Tilly at Roger Stone Pentecostal Church in Wales in the UK just recently, by the way, and the Holy Spirit came upon him with power. He is so full of love and he's out on the streets boldly proclaiming the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So don't you ever give up on someone who needs Christ. Don't ever give up on a salvation, you know, is there where, uh, you know, for everybody. And it can come to those who appear to be absolutely positively unreachable. And yet, you know, as God's people, you know, we're dealing with the flesh. If we're not dealing in the spirit, we're dealing with the flesh. And we would look at somebody like that and discount them. I'm not going to go near that guy. We don't love them enough to stick them on a stretcher and do whatever we got to do. And again, with this, with this whole, you know, uh, you know, scripture, we cannot just focus on the paralytic. It's not about the paralytic. It's about the four people willing to take them to Jesus. Are you willing to take them to Jesus? Are you willing to deal with the risk, pay the consequence, tear into a roof or, or be in the presence of somebody that if you're walking in the flesh, you'd be afraid of. But, you know, as I look at these people once again, and I see what they've done to their bodies and all, all, all this weirdness, if you will, I know they're hurting puppies. That's why they're doing it. So have the compassion. You never give up on somebody. Here he is, the great, great, whatever grandson of Charles Spurgeon. Can you even imagine, you know, what kind of testimony this young man's going to have? Because somebody loved him enough, got rid of the judgment, loved him enough, took him on a stretcher and take him to Jesus. That's what you and I need to do. So who do you love? You know, the lo just the lovable ones in your life. That's a piece of cake. Don't feel happy, you know, about yourself just because you can love lovable ones. Anybody can love a lovable one. That's not, you know, if you, if you can only love a lovable one, you can probably count on getting a lot of unlovable ones in, in your life. So God can refine you. You only like the respectable ones, you know, the clean cut people that look like people in your church or people you dress the way you think they should dress or, or maybe how about the decent ones in your life? Just the ones that, you know, don't, you, you don't drink, don't smoke, don't chase women or whatever that thing is they say, right? Just the decent ones, are they, are those the ones you love? Or do you strive to love like Christ loves? Are you able to look at somebody like Charles Spurgeon's great, great grandson there and look at him and with love in your heart and say, oh, I need to get him in the presence of Jesus. That's the weight of love, right? And so will we, will we do that? Who do, you, who do you love? And, you know, we, I shared this with you guys a long time ago now. Uh, in a, in a uh, uh, teaching that we had on uh, contentment and complacency. 
and and th this man this is a real this is a real homeless man right and he was found on his knees in the street praying and giving thanks that that's what love and faith and hope that's what it looks like we can't gauge whatever we whatever we are in christ by materialistic things and, and where we're able to live and does god love us enough to give us a good house that's not what it is this man is you know he when he was asked why a homeless man with nothing would be thanking god and he replied god will never forsake me and though i might not have much in material things i have the greatest gift of all salvation thanks to jesus christ he said my riches don't come from man and money but from our heavenly father homeless and yet so rich do you have a heart like that because i'll tell you one thing i i don't need to meet this guy to know that that man utters the name of jesus on the street probably labeled a lunatic right I, I do know that in the story that I read about him, so he was in this state, in this uh, homeless state, when somebody loved him enough to tell him about Jesus. And look at him now in his scraggly clothes. And you might look at it and say, oh, I could never, I would hate it. It'd be awful if I had to live like that. Maybe, and it would be. But what he focuses on is Jesus, not his car and his house and whatever else. Do you love people enough to look at a man like that, to look at Adam, you know, Spurgeon's grandson, to look at the paralytic and carry them to Jesus? Because somebody did. I thank God somebody loved me that much. It uh, introduced me to the greatest gift of all. And then, then there's who do you hate? Who is it that you can't let go of? I, I was talking about the, uh, you know, walking on water and, and, and how I was, you know, molested. There was a pedophile in my life. It's not fun, right? But but who do you hate? You hate all pedophiles because you hate that stuff because they're perverts. Hey, maybe you hate drug addicts. So, you know, just I hate it. I, 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 I grew up with it. I used to be it. Whatever. You hate drug. How about those tattooed ones and the ones with the piercings and the plugs in their ears and ones that are just have so massacred their own bodies right uh you, you remember we were talking about recently that man that uh i shared with you he was uh, molested when he was 16 became a homosexual and then uh his uh the person who violated him said you're too pretty to be a, a boy and so he started dressing like a woman and he had all kinds of surgeries and he was a dancer you know he did all these you know vile things if you will and uh you know trying to be a woman when he was a man and he got sick and he was in the um in the emergency room in a wheelchair just sitting there and he said he, he just looked down he you know he looked down at his body and he said i was filled with shame uh, i was looking at this body say what have i done to myself you know he just conviction right just immediately and he said he saw an old lady and old man i don't know how old probably <laughs> probably my old but saw an old lady and an old man across the room in the in the, in the waiting room and he said they just look so sweet you know, they had this sweet expression on their face and uh they, they, they the couple got up and walked over to him the old lady put her hand on his now he had he looked like a freak show using his description right and she put her hand on his shoulder and said honey do you know jesus she picked him up on a stretcher tore open that roof and said i gotta get this guy in the presence of jesus and he did uh you know get saved it's a long story but basically what happened was uh you know as he went home he kept hearing the voice of god in his spirit saying you don't know me you don't know me and so it just kind of not haunted is a horrible word to say but it just stayed with him every every turn he kept hearing this and he finally said to tune it all out i turned on the tv and the only thing on tv that i could find at that hour was you know a preacher televangelist or something and he got saved in his living room right and so here he was he he not a tattooed one but one that had been just 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 massacred his own body right the, that old lady whatever she however old she was loved him enough to go across to the scary looking creature you know and say donnie do you know jesus and how about the mean ones the means that are horrible so you know behind the anger and the meanness there's always some hurt right that's what's going on it's not just mean this is something going on how about when they're mean to you you know do you hate them and and, and remember don't be playing with don't be deceiving yourself because you can't fool god so don't say well i don't really hate them i just don't like them and i don't you know i I, I won't talk to them and I'll, I'll treat them like this, but I don't hate on That is the definition of hate. So how about those main ones? How many, maybe it's the politicians out there. Maybe it's Trump. Maybe it's Biden. Maybe it's Pelosi and all this stuff going on. Who, who, who do you hate, right? And uh, maybe it's cheaters. Maybe you were cheated on in a marriage. You hate cheaters. Well, good for you. Uh, God created all of us, right? And he loves all of us. No matter what that looks like in your mind, because of your baggage or whatever, he loves each one and he sees us as something beautiful and something worthy and so you know when we look at the the, the people the, the mean ones the cheaters you know whatever that thing is going on wh who do you hate 
Who is it that you hate? He get, is there enough love within you for anybody, that street uh, the homeless man, the tattooed uh, Charles Spurgeon grandson, anybody? Is there enough love in you for Jesus that you would want to put him on a stretcher? You walk down that bumpy road, you'd be in the heat of the day, you tear open a roof and you drop them just to get them in the presence of, do you even love like that? Because, you know, remember what the word says, you better be loving, right? There's a weight of love sometimes. And the $64 question tonight is, will you carry it? Will you be willing to do that? Will you be willing to be one of the four to carry somebody to Jesus like that? Or will you answer for withholding love from the lost ones? Because I'll tell you one thing, you know, there, it's not possible again. If there's no love in you, if Christ died for the love in you, he's not in you. And so it's time to examine our hearts and really, uh, you know, uh, I know I'm probably stomping on toes, but we need conviction over this stuff. You can't go around like a hypocrite. You can't go around not extending love to anybody. Neighbors doesn't say uh, in my family or the ones I like or the lovable ones or the pretty ones or the decent way. No, no, no. You love everybody as yourself. And you know what? We don't love anybody except Christ more than we love ourselves, right? So we need to be treating them the way we would be treated, want to be treated. So will you, you will answer for that? Or will you get to a point in your life where you say, oh, the time is coming and hell is a very real place. And you know, the, we've all been given the great commission to share the gospel. Will you get to that place where you'll pay, you'll pay the price, you'll carry the stretcher, you'll tear open the rooftop just to get somebody in the presence of Jesus, because you know that all the healing and all the hope is at the foot of the cross. And remember, First John 4 again, we love because he first loved us. We don't love because you found some golden nugget. You, you, we love because he first loved us. You didn't pick anything. He picked you. Wh whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. So that hate, again, don't, don't be saying, well, I don't hate. Don't play with words because he's not hearing those words, right? And so if, if you hate a brother or sister, you can't forgive. You have the vengeance. You have, you know, separation with you're a liar. And, and it's not a good thing, you know, not a good future for you. So whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister, which means all males and females, not your family members that you naturally love. So love is a deal breaker here. It's the number one. It's the first two, uh, you know, important commands that we hear, right? Uh, I love your God with all your heart and then love your neighbor as yourself. It, there's no way around it. And so it's not okay to just love the people in our church, love the nice people, love the decent people, love our family members. That's not what we're talking about here. That's a given, right? So we've got to love people enough to put them on that uh, stretcher, to walk wherever we got to walk, to go wherever we got to go, uh, to, to introduce them to Jesus because he is where the hope is, right? And so that's it. The weight of love. There is a weight of love. And uh, it's not an easy journey. You know, uh, I, I often say, well, when I was a heathen, happy heathen, right? I'm like, ah, I wouldn't want anything to do with that. I like having fun. I thought if I come to Christ, I'm going to have to quit having fun. <laughs> I'm going to have to leave that stuff behind. But after I came to Christ, it was natural for me to transform. I wanted to please him. And so I wanted to be all that he created me me to be. And the more I went to the cross, the more I saw sin, the more I repented, the more I repented, the more I repented, and the more the love grew within me. And so if there's anything, you know, I've, I, I said this weekend uh, to a couple of friends, you know, talking about the beauty of the barn and, you know, kind of the material things, if you will. And, and, and I was telling them about the journey of it. And I said, the one thing I can assure you when you come to the well is that you won't be judged. You can come as you are and I'm going to love you because I know how to love. That much I've mastered. I know how to love. And I'll pick a stretcher up and I'll tear open a roof and I'll go to jail for it if I have to. And I'll lower that stretcher down. But what about you? Are you willing to love that way? And so let's open it up. And after I stomped on toes, and by the way, don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> you could say what you want, but I'm just a messenger. <laughs> That's it. Anybody? Daryl, looks like you went on. Wonderful message, Lynn. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's very timely as usual. Uh, I was asked to be a ballot box watcher for, uh, for the vote. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a bunch of us and we're on the schedule and whatnot. And there's a store uh, here. Uh, it's in the county. It's not in the city. But uh, the ballot box is in that parking lot. It's, it's not in the parking lot per se, but it's 
it's uh, you have to be in the parking lot to access the box. So at any rate, we have been parking in that store's lot. Well, we have a group of socialists here in our little town that approached the store and put pressure on them. They called the sheriff and said, um, you know, we don't want uh, the ballot box watchers parking in our parking lot. So that put a lot of pressure on us because we have to park in areas that are, are visible and that sort of thing. So long story short, um, we're being challenged, you know, in our uh, uh, passion, you know, for this time of, uh, of seizing our nation, the vote and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And boy, these are the times when we're being challenged in terms of our love, because it's so easy to be angry. That's right. And to look past that person as, a, as someone who Jesus loves and, right. and get angry. And so your message kind of hits home. Okay. And, you know, I remember as a 26-year-old um, coming out of Canada, you know, drugs and alcohol and, and whatnot. And I lost my dad three months after he, mm -hmm. he came uh, or I came back from Canada. Wow. And I went into a church, my brother, uh, I eventually lived with my brother and his wife, but I went into a church, Pentecostal church, unbeknownst to me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I was there one night, you know, long hair, leather jacket, tight pants, Joe Cool. But <laughs> I had a weight of guilt on me uh, because of my dad's passing, because we did not have a good relationship. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. But, you know, the the whoever had the met the uh, service that night said you know I just feel like uh, there are needs here and uh, God wants to to meet those needs and if you have something stand up so here's Joe Cool standing up you know uh, tears that's beautiful tears flowing and uh, and I just gave that thing to the Lord and you know it was gone just like that. Wow. Just like that, that thing was gone and has never returned. Oh, that's and beautiful. Such a miracle. But I didn't have to get cleaned up. I didn't have to be anything but available to the Lord. That's right. And you know, I drove home that night with a song uh, ringing in my heart and in my ears from that evening. It was Jesus loveth even me, though I'm not what I should be. And, uh, you know, just absolute mess driving home. But boy, I'll tell you what, what a transforming night. That's and so from that transformation to this, I have never questioned God's love for me. Oh, that is beautiful. And he filled that hole in your heart, just like, boom, that was it. And wiped all the tear away. That's a beautiful testimony, Daryl. So Absolutely. Beautiful. Yeah. And probably plenty of people looking at Joe Cool saying, that one's hopeless. Look at that one. He to get his hair cut. Yeah. Right? He looks yeah. like a hoodlum. Yeah. We do it all the time. We're all, I mean, seriously, it, it, it's bad. It's really bad that yeah. we can't show that kind of love. Because as I look on this side of life, you know, I, we moved around. It was just tumultuous, right? And I can't identify, but, but I can think about a certain, I uh, can't identify their names, but I can think about people along the way that their compassion for a child was unbelievable. And I know they had to be Christians. I know they had to be, right? I think about the people that they would, those little buses would come pick us up. And, you know, I told you my parents would love to get the house empty on Sunday morning. Uh, but I can think about the kindness they express, you know, um, in doing that. But but here we are, my, my the former local church, you know, we were given this uh, do, um, anonymous donation, $85,000 bus, right, to to cart people around. I said, oh, wow, we can go get, if, if we can get permission, we can get, you know, people in here. We can bring the kids here. And they said, we can't let people like that in here. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? We can't let people like that in here. So we, we, we got a lot of work to do. And, and I'm That's not saying what it was it's for. Easy. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's easy. It's not easy, yeah. but it's possible. I, that way. I know myself, I have, I have two, two things. One is I was taking a class once and there was a, a young lady that I was uh, paired with to have a conversation with. And she had all the, you know, the metal and stuff in her face and her ears and, you know, all this. And every time you saw her, there was more of it. She, if she'd have walked down the street and they'd have had one of those big magnets, 
you know, it would have sucked her right off the sidewalk. Wow. And and I asked her when we were in the conversation, I, I said, and I said, I don't mean to be derogatory, and I'm not trying to be nasty, but I said, you're not someone I would normally be sitting here with and having a conversation because of all the hardware. Mm -hmm. It's it's hiding who you really are. Mm -hmm. While she was doing it to get attention from her mother, who was also in the class, and she was with somebody else. Mm -hmm. And and uh, so we had this long conversation about this and all that. And I said, is it getting you what you want? Or are you continuing to add more metal, thinking that they're going to accept you now with the more stuff that you continue to do? And you're not hurting anybody but yourself, you know. Mm -hmm. And so when we got to the end of the class and she came to graduation, all the metal was gone. She was dressed in the nines. I mean, talk about it, an extremely beautiful woman. I almost didn't recognize her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I saw her at the end. And and it was just that whole conversation about, you know, God and what he looks at you and how he sees you and how other people can see you mm -hmm. if they could really see you. Right. If they can't see you through all the the, the stuff, you know. Right. And then when I went through that um, uh, real bad divorce, um, there was a, you know, like you in the in the, in the book, you know, um, there was a lot of hate and, and everything. And even my son at one point, uh, we had, um, I, I kept saying I was giving it up because I had to get away from it all. I had to give it up to God and just let him handle it or I was going to just lose my mind. And, and, and people would, you know, I, and I had talked to a counselor and I described to him what I intended to do. Mm -hmm. And the only thing he kept saying to me is, please don't let me see this on the news. Please, God, you got to promise me. And I said, not today. And I had to live my life with not today. Right. And then when I moved up here, my son and I were having a conversation and he said, he said, Dad, he said, you got two choices. Just like you've told us your entire life. He said, you could be like Grandpa and die the way Grandpa died. Alone, nobody, nobody around, nobody, you know, mm -hmm. and angry because of his own choices. Or you can let it all go. Just turn it all over. He said, you still have all of us kids. You've got all the grandkids. You've got all the great grandkids. What do you want to have? You want to have grandpa's life? Or do you want to have your life? Mm -hmm. And just bang like that. It was, you know, like somebody hit me in the head with a hammer. Right. You know, and, and I realized that I could do that. I just turned it all over to God and said, mm -hmm. whatever you do is fine with me. And, and yes. I, I will accept whatever, you know, however this goes. That's right. And um, just forgive me for, you know, just put the love back in my heart to be able to say, I love and I forgive and, and it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. That's you right. Know? And, uh, it was the best decision I've ever made. Absolutely. Praise God. I don't know. Some about what you were sharing there in the beginning with the young lady and the, all the, uh, what'd you call it? <laughs> anyway. All the hardware. Yeah. Hardware. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking about that. It's a story about the man in the, in the um, ER, you know, room that the woman came over to. And when he was telling his testimony, he just wept. And he said, why didn't anybody tell me about Jesus sooner? How yeah. People and, and so he's driven to share, you know, with young people about Jesus. Because he said, "Look at my, look at my life. What I did to my life, you know, all because I didn't know Jesus." And Jesus took it all the way. And, and, and there's not. Listen, we got to be, we got to be like the four guys, loving enough to carry that paralytic down the street. Whatever we got to do to introduce people to Jesus, it's not up to us to say, "Well, they don't deserve it," or "They're, uh, you know, they're hopeless," or 
you know, I'm not going to talk to them because, you know, I can tell they're from the pit of hell. What are you doing? <laughs> he loves us all the same. It's yeah. hard to remember that when we look out and see people, you know, maybe doing horrible things or whatever. It's, it's hard to remember that. But he loves us all the same. And, you know, we're supposed to go out and share. And if they reject us and they persecute us, they spit on us or, or whatever they do. Well, you know, that, that's the way it is. That's the way it's going to be for all of us if we're living for Christ. Again, we live for him, not with him, with this peach fuzzy thing that says, I got my ticket to heaven. And we're supposed to be living for him, right? And, and, and striving to be, as we see every week, to be holy as he is holy. And, you know, but, but it comes all, in all kinds of shapes and sizes, you know. One thing, you see the enemy, with the enemy will fire. The enemy loves dissension, loves to lie, you know. And I've shared with you so many times, at this stage of my life, in my walk, you know, when I meet someone, and it doesn't matter, business, it doesn't matter what it is. My first thought is I want to find out where their soul is. That's the first, I don't care if I had $2 million deal in front of me. My first thought is I want to know where their soul is. What's the condition of their soul, right? Because that's all any of us are. Where does a soul with a package, right? We got different packages, <laughs> you know, packages that are getting old, packages that will die. But the soul will never die. It's either going to be eternally in heaven or eternally in hell. And so when you hear this dissension of maybe it's racism, I don't want to hear that nonsense because you're still dealing with a soul, just a different package, right? And so all that dissension that's stirred up with over things like that, uh, you know, that's got to go, whatever. But we have this idea of who's worthy, who's not worthy, who's this, who's that. We're all a soul. He created us all and he loves us all the same. And so we got to, you know, be the, be the, be one of the four men carrying that person and knocking that roof off. So thank you for that. Anybody else? You know, Carol and I watched a movie. I cannot remember the name of it. He probably would because he, he ordered it. He some movies. And this particular one, a, a youth minister took his youth into a, a graveyard. Mm. And he said, now listen, listen real good. Can you hear the people saying, why didn't you tell me about Jesus? Ooh. That was really, that had a lot of impact. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Imagine um, how many Christians oh, are, are in the Charles Spurgeon line, right? How many people? I could just, you know, I'm making stuff up because I don't know, but I just can imagine family doing kind of like what you were talking about with your nephew. Oh, the whole man, that one, Adam, oh, boy, is he a piece of work. He's probably his own family wasn't even, you know, really sharing Christ with him because, well, he should know he grew up in the Baptist church or whatever, right? We're not even doing that because we look at him and say, forget about it. But some woman took uh, took it upon herself to carry him and, and lower him down to the feet of Jesus. I want to love like that. I don't know about you, but that's the way I want to love. Anybody else? Weight of love. Okay. Nothing else and I'll pray us out of here. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for your love. We thank you for sending your son to die for us. We thank you, Lord, for giving us friendships and, and, and ways to gather together, even something as simple as tonight. Lord, I just pray uh, that this message, as I was pondering love, love in my life and love in the, in, the, in the eyes of Christ, Lord, that we need to love like those four men. I pray it convicted everybody on here and everybody listening to well after this recording stops right and i just pray god that we be convicted to to do to strive to love like jesus did and so lord forgive us and and and, and again convict us and that conviction does bring us to a place of repentance lord that uh we can turn things around and, and we're in a dark world that appears to keep getting darker uh the light needs to shine so i pray that we let it shine and we're willing to pay the price to pull that, knock that roof off with our bare hands and lower uh, the ones that need you, Lord, the unsaved ones to the foot of the cross. So we thank you for it all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. You know, I love you. And it's so good to gather here. And I'm glad to see some people I haven't seen on here in a while and then some newbies. It's great. Lynn and Carmen, you're out there somewhere. I, I guess you, I don't know, did you not get the barn painted or, or uh, the roof fixed? Uh, we we went to two we went to two church services today and Carmen's in the other room talking to her daughter. Uh, uh, so, gotcha. yeah. 
Um, so we just kind of relaxing on a Sunday afternoon. That's wonderful. And again, I, I just admire you guys on the West Coast, you, Di, and whoever else is out there. Because it's afternoon time, it's nap time. <laughs> yes. It's nap time when we gather. Great, um, great message, Lynn. Thank you so much. I love you guys. And uh, you can take that to the bank. And you know where to find me if you need me. I'll see you all next week. We'll see what the Lord has. Hey, take care, guys. Thank you. 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 Thank you.